Um, I have been asked uh, uh, to talk about, by uh, Julius, to talk about campaigning and painism and speciesism and to talk about a little bit about their histories. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, Pope Francis's recent encyclical, Laudato Si, which is beginning to alter the Roman Catholic view of animals. So that's important. Although I'm not religious, I um, have to say I'm very impressed by Pope Francis Pope Francis's recent encyclical. Attitudes are changing. Many years ago, I, I recall some kindly and compassionate Roman Catholics looking at me with surprise when I mentioned that I worked for the welfare of animals. They not only thought that I had my priorities wrong, they actually made me feel almost as though I was a heretic that I was somehow acting against the will of God. When I managed to get such people to explain their grounds for this attitude, they said they'd been taught as children in Sunday schools and in the nursery that fondness for animals was an actual sin, that the natural love for animals shown by children was in some way unchristian and had to be stamped out. It was not just that it was weakness and sentimentality, but that it was deeply wrong. Animals were given to us by God for us to exploit them, so their teachers had told them. Only human beings were made, made in the image of God. This, of course, is speciesism at its most extreme. I know speciesism is a, different, a difficult word. Even in English, you have to have drunk at least two gin and tonics before it is possible to say it. Speciesism. Until recently, so I'm told, it was quite a common attitude among Roman Catholics. How could such callousness and cruelty have ever developed, especially as part of a religion that correctly claims to be the religion of love. I suspect that there were at least three historical sources for this Christian speciesism, and they all go back some 2,000 years, although, of course, the evidence is only fragmentary, and I'm really guessing. The first, my first guess is that the reason was down to diet, food, I'm sure that wars have been fought over diet. Diet is mentioned in almost every religion. I believe the eating of meat is based upon a physical addiction. Meat addicts, often with a sense of guilt about the cruelty they're causing, have become angry when more compassionate people have reproved them, have criticized them. They've shouted back, that the Bible says that God has given them animals so that they can eat them. They said this especially after the flood. In the beginning of Genesis, it suggests that humans were vegetarians. And then, for some reason, God changed his mind. The second reason, over the centuries, has obviously been vested interests. The farmers and the butchers and the furriers, people producing fur, the hunters and anyone selling animals for money. They didn't want animals to be uh, given equal rights with human beings. Didn't the animal sellers in the temple in Jerusalem become angry when a furious Jesus Christ drove them out of the temple, surely it was the animal sellers who got him arrested. It was they who pretended that Jesus was a political terrorist and caused 
Pilate to crucify him. So I believe it was probably the animal exploiters who killed Jesus. You may ask, why was Jesus alone and so angry in the temple in the first place? Personally, I believe it was because he cared about animals. As you know, the main business, the main business in the temple was selling and killing animals for sacrifice. I think he was campaigning against this cruelty to animals. How could, how could such a compassionate man not be angered by such cruelty? It was said that the temple stank of blood. Eventually, the heat is getting to me. I'm going to have to. The third historical reason, I guess, <coughs> for Christian speciesism is that Christianity only survived because of the support of the Roman Empire from the year 313 AD. But it was the supporters of the Roman way of life who then altered Christianity so that it suited them. And what were the Romans famous for? How did they spend their spare time when not fighting wars? Was it football? No, the answer is being cruel to animals. Just as we are obsessed with football, so the Romans were obsessed by the so-called sports of the amphitheatre. The crowds went there to watch humans and animals fighting each other. This was their main entertainment. Every major Roman town had such sports. They were here all over. Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Spain, everywhere there were amphitheatres where on Saturdays you would go to watch animals being killed. This was their main entertainment. To an extent, it epitomized the human conquest of nature and human dominion and our supposed right to exploit and ravage our environment. Romans hacked their ways through the jungles to capture lions and elephants for the Colosseum. Giraffes from Africa, tigers from India. The Roman culture was based upon cruelty. It sadistically glorified conquest and dominion. True, when it was taken over by the Romans in AD 313, Christianity did begin to reduce the ferocity of the Roman culture. It was a contest between the culture of cruelty and the religion of compassion. Humans killing humans in the amphitheatre became, became controversial and began to die out. Eventually, Christianity stopped the killing of humans for sport. But the spectators, the Roman spectators, still wanted blood. They were addicted to the sight of cruelty. So this was all the more reason to increase the tormenting and killing of animals. Watching others fighting each other from a safe distance has always been exciting. It is why medieval tourists used to watch battles from the hills safely on the other side of the river, and of course why we have violent films today. So for these three reasons, I would guess the addiction to meat, the vested interest in animal exploiters, sorry, the vested interest of animal exploiters, and Roman mass entertainment. These were, I suspect, the reasons why Romanized Christianity was speciesist and remained so for 1,700 years, I would say, until the publication of Laudato Si recently. Of course, there were other reasons, but these three were very considerable. The contest over Christian speciesism has continued over the centuries between the early saints and St. Francis on one hand and St. Thomas Aquinas 
and Aristotle on the other. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, as I'm sure you all know, had a huge influence upon Christianity, upon Roman Catholicism. But of course, he was basing much of his thought upon the rediscovery of pagan writers like Aristotle. Aquinas didn't think much of women either, or foreigners. He was a, a racist. But I guess that it was these three reasons that still formed the basis for the underlying speciesist position that he reinforced. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis vigorously attacks anthropocentrism, putting human beings at the center. Anthropocentrism is an example of speciesism. It means literally putting the human species at the moral center of existence. I define speciesism as discrimination based upon the supposed moral superiority of one species over another. I question how the species difference itself, any more than sexual or racial differences, can justify such a prejudice. In practice, this usually refers to the widespread tendency of humans to give other species a far lower moral status than that of our own species. This claims to be based upon our greater intelligence, our autonomy, or some other morally irrelevant trait. In Painism, I argue that the only trait, the only characteristic that matters morally is the capacity to suffer pain, where pain is defined broadly to cover any negative experience whether mental or physical, including fear, grief, and deprivations of liberty or justice. All these experiences cause pain of one sort or another. Speciesism is a prejudice like racism and sexism, as nearly all modern moral theories are based upon the principle of not causing pain to others. I make pain central to this theory that I call painism. I say it is wrong to cause pain to other individuals, regardless of their race, sex, or species. So X amount of pain in a dog matters equally with X amount of pain in a robot, or an alien, or a human being. I believe the moral theory of painism solves some of the obvious problems in modern ethics. Basically, it gives each painient individual its own importance, as indeed does Wright's theory. It is based upon the very def definite foundation of pain, like the British theory of utilitarianism. And it is not arbitrary which I think is one of the main problems with virtue ethics. I'm a psychologist rather than a philosopher myself, although I have been a professor in a philosophy department in America. But um, it's always bothered me in a way that we don't seem to be quite sure what we base our moral theories on. When something happens that's controversial morally, in the newspapers or television or whatever, people will come out with a, sec with a collection of mm, reactions that are more or less predictable. Um, it's a mixture of Christian religions, Christian attitudes, and other sorts of attitudes, perhaps from Immanuel Kant in Germany, perhaps from Jeremy Bentham in England, um, they all seem to be rather mixed together and it's always bothered me that we don't seem to have finally agreed what our basic moral code is. I think more and more people are moving towards the idea that's often been at the basis of morality in religions and that is that we should not 
cause suffering to others. And Barbara Gardner, who's going to talk later, will talk about this extraordinary unanimity, agreement between the religions over what is right and wrong. Ultimately, it's something to do with causing pain to others. Particularly when you do away with the idea of doing things to please God, when you take a more secular view, we seem to be left with this common view that it's wrong to cause suffering to others. And the so-called golden rule that's been around in religions for 2,000 years at least, that you should not do to others what you would not like others to do to you, seems to be the basic rule. And painism really is trying to get there um, while doing away with some of the major problems of the other ethical codes that we use. Um, I've said already, rights theory seems to be rather arbitrary. You can choose, obviously, obvious things like the right to life, the right to freedom, and so on. But if you read some of the charters of rights, they said some of them go into great details, you know, um, the right to use your car on Thursdays, or the right to go shopping, or the right to... I mean, where do you draw the line? It seems you can clutch out of the air almost anything and make it a right. And that is what I find unsatisfactory about rights theory. I mean, I agree it, I support nearly all of it, but it seems to me to be an unsatisfactory way to base all our law upon the idea of rights if you can just suddenly say, I think um, we have the right to have the windows open, or we, you know, we, where do you stop? Um, and rather the same with virtue ethics. You know, I, I can say I think that bravery is a virtue. Um, kindness is a virtue. Yes, yes, yes. But then I could equally well say I think that um, uh, cruelty is a virtue. Uh, and on, in both cases, it would be difficult to find justifications for saying that something is a virtue. Again, it is rather arbitrary. Um, utilitarianism, I like a lot because it, it comes clean. It says what we're really concerned about is the pain and pleasure of others, or the pain and pleasures of ourselves and others. Uh, that at the basis, when you've gone all right, you can insist upon liberty, or you can insist upon fairness, you can insist upon equality, but why are fairness, liberty, and equality good? The answer is because if you don't have them, you suffer. You suffer mental pain. And ultimately, if you ask yourself why is something good, and you nearly always end up with the answer because it causes relief from suffering, happiness. So I think that painism hopefully gets round some of the major problems. The major problem in utilitarianism is that Jeremy Bentham, who was really the father of utilitarianism, had this idea that you determine the goodness of an action by adding up all the pains and the pleasures caused by it in others. And he included animals. I mean, he was very, this is 1789. Um, but the problem with, with Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism was that he said, you should add them all up. So if I throw a, a brick into a, out of the window and it hits two or three people and a dog and a cat outside, I've got to add up the suffering of those three human beings and the dog and the cat and to make a grand total of 100 units of pain. Um, uh, and then if I, if nevertheless the brick had caused 200 units of pleasure to other people, then you could say that throwing the brick out of the window was, was justified. That's the way he thought. And all I'm saying is that I don't think it makes sense psychologically to add up the pains of separate individuals, or the pleasures of separate individuals. Because 
no person actually suffers that total that you get. The total is unreal because is nobody, no, nobody suffers it. You are adding up something that has to be experienced and you're treating pains as if they were apples or pears, uh, not experiences. In painism, the degree of wrongness of, a, of an event is measured not by the number of sufferers, but by the quantity of pain experienced by the maximum sufferer. We tend daily, when we're re looking at the newspapers and so on, to see that newspapers always regard the accident in which a hundred people are killed as being much more important than an accident in which one person is killed or two people are killed. And I'm saying, I'm questioning that because you can't add up the pains of all these hundred people. Surely the way of really measuring the badness of, of an event is by looking at the amount of suffering experienced by the maximum sufferer. So, for example, one individual suffering 10 units of pain, the argument goes, uh, matters more than two individuals who are each suffering nine units. Utilitarianism argues the other way around. It says that nine plus nine is 18, and 18 is considerably bigger than 10. But I say that the agony of any one individual, for example, matters more than the mere inconvenience of millions of individuals. Incidentally, pleasure should never justify another's pain, in my opinion, and that's another grounds on which you can argue with utilitarianism. But basically, we still have to remember that not causing pain to others is the basis of all sound moral theories, including pains. Science cannot yet explain how consciousness occurs, but the consciousness of pain is fundamental to all ethics and all law. There are maybe some lawyers here. Are there any people with legal qualifications? Or, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, much more lawyers here than, than philosophers. Well, then, you may say, what's this chap waffling on about uh, morality all the time? You want to hear about law. Well, all I would say is that I'm assuming that we want our laws to be based upon good ethics, good morality. In attacking speciesism, or rather anthropocentrism, to go back to Pope Francis, he actually uses some quite strong language. He calls anthropocentrism tyrannical, misguided, distorted, and excessive. He stresses our close connection with the rest of creation, describing our relationship with the other animals as, in quotes, a universal fraternity. That's the Franciscan theme, of course, where St. Francis talked about his brother animals. Unfortunately, St. Francis went on and talked about brother clouds and brother sun and brother moon, things that are probably not capable of experiencing pain. The Pope recognizes the importance of pain, however, by saying that science must not treat animals as if they were parts, quote, of an insensate order, an unfeeling collection. There are, however, still several areas of ambivalence, uncertainty in what Pope Francis says. He uses words like living and creation without distinguishing clearly between trees and animals and even rocks, because rocks too are creation. Most people, well, I will ask this audience, are there many people in this audience who believe that rocks can experience pain? One person. 
two people. Yes, that exactly the same score happened in an audience the other day I had. Um, are there uh, many people who believe that trees can suffer pain? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, I think. And I think there are about 50 people in the room, so that's 22%. That's quite high. Um, are there any people who think that caterpillars can experience pain? Yes, just three quarters, I would think. Yeah. And how about dogs? How many believe that dogs can experience pain? Is there anyone who thinks that dogs cannot experience pain? Nobody. So that's interesting, isn't it? We seem to be grading our judgments on the phylogenetic scale. And then most people make a big distinction between, well, the trouble is plants, of course. As soon as you begin to think that plants suffer pain, it becomes very difficult to know what it is we can eat, for example. Um, there, is, there was some research, some Russian research, research a few years ago that showed that um, plants reacted quite demonstrably. If you wired them up in the correct way, you could find quite strong physiological reactions when you pulled them out of the ground or cut them off. Um, and people said this was pain. Well. I think we have to make a distinction between pain and other reactions. If you take a piece of gunpowder and you hit it with a hammer, you may get a very violent reaction, if it's the right sort of gunpowder. But that doesn't mean to say that it was experiencing pain. It was reacting to your mistreatment of it, but it wasn't therefore experiencing pain. I love trees. I hope they don't suffer. Instinctively, I feel worried and upset when I see someone cutting down a tree unnecessarily. So I know what those people mean who say they think. But I think we have to be careful, because otherwise we could be in a difficult position when it comes to lunchtime. <laughs> I do not happen to believe that rocks and trees suffer pain, but animals certainly do, and most audiences today in the modern world agree with that. Although as you get down the phylogenetic scale to uh, fish, um, well there's very good ev evidence scientifically incidentally that fish can suffer, they have the same sort of nervous systems that we have, they have the same sort of chemicals transmitting pain uh, in their brains that we have in, in ours, and there are the similar sort of um, evolutionary arguments supporting the possibility. But when you get to things like uh, insects, um, it becomes difficult and uncertain. All things that suffer pain, I believe, have moral status. And that could include robots and aliens. There's a discussion now about artificial intelligence. Um, and it's not really a question of intelligence, because as a psychologist, I would define intelligence as the ability to solve problems, which is irrelevant. The question is, are they conscious? And we don't know what causes consciousness. I mean, it is the one great big scientific problem that's unsolved. People are thinking about what is the cause of consciousness, and they haven't got any answers yet. We simply don't know. And yet it's a very common experience. We all lose consciousness every day when we go to sleep. We all gain consciousness when we wake up. And yet nobody knows actually what is happening in the brain when this happens. Which is very strange. But I think if we argued, for example, that it is sheer complexity... Well, I think most people would accept that consciousness has something to do with the brain. It's not what's going on in our right foot that affects the issue. It's something to do with our central nervous system. Um, it may be the sheer complexity of it, because we all know that brains of mammals, for example, are some of the most complex things in the universe. 
Is it complexity itself that somehow causes consciousness? When I discussed this question years ago with the um, famous British psychologist Richard Gregory, I asked him what he thought about this. Was it a, a problem with complexity? And he said it might be. He's always thought how strange it is that, that you're getting something so different out of the brain. Consciousness is so different from the substance of the brain. We know there's electricity in the brain. We know there are chemical reactions going on in the brain. We know that the brain is a very complex machine. If, for example, you mix complexity together with electricity, as you do in computers and robots, is consciousness going to emerge spontaneously? And supposing they can't tell us that they're suffering, are cars conscious? They're not able to tell us. Are they sufficiently conscious? We simply don't know. I'm not suggesting they necessarily are, but we may perhaps like to consider we ought to be bearing in mind the possibility that we are more or less getting to the stage in our technology where we may be able to uh, create something that's conscious without realizing that we've done it. I invoke the precautionary principle to argue that it's up to the exploiters of robots to prove that they do not suffer. It's not up to us robot rescuers to prove that they do suffer. It's up to the exploiters to prove the reverse. Now I'm now going to look at some recent history. The modern Western political and philosophical concern for the moral and legal status of non-humans um, actually, as far as I can see, started in Britain in the 18th century. And there was a lot of discussion in Britain. Uh, men of letters, philosophers, um, and many others uh, talked about animals and cruelty to animals and their moral position. Utilitarians such as Jeremy Bentham had prepared the way and anti-slavery politicians like Lord Erskine and William Wilberforce pushed it through the British Houses of Parliament in London. In 1822, the first parliamentary legislation went through. I think it was actually Germany who came second. And here I can't even remember the research I did 30 years ago into the history of the development of the movement. But it was... Um, Germans in about the 1840s who, who began to get interested in this idea of giving animals um, some moral status. And then there were great Germans like Richard Wagner. I don't know whether you all know this. Richard Wagner actually wrote that he based all his artistic work upon his concern for the suffering of animals. I know he wrote a lot of things. Um, he, he liked to say exciting things. But, he, but I have actually read that in black and white, that he said this. And he did a lot to help the anti-vivisection movement in the 1870s. Anyway, to go back to the 1820s, um, fairly soon after the passing of the first legislation to protect the ill treatment of cows and cattle, pigs, um, the same sort of men in England, the politicians who were anti-slavers mostly, um, set up the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, in 1824, two years later, in order to enforce the legislation that they'd got through Parliament and to keep up the pressure for more legislation. Germany soon followed and so did some of the other northern European countries. Reforms continued, especially in the Ed Edwardian era, that's in, you know, in the 1910 period in England, but the movement came to a standstill with the Great War of 1914 to 1918. 
And in the stunned silence after 1918, the animal movement hardly got going again before the Second World War broke out in 1939. Nothing really new happened until the 1960s, when one or two people began to write books about factory farming. Bridget Brophy wrote a long piece in the Sunday Times in England about the forgotten issue of animal rights. Nobody had used that phrase for 50 years. Brian Davis, who you may have heard of, set up IFOR, the International Fund for Animal Welfare in Canada. And one or two demonstrations in England against fox hunting, the sport of fox hunting, occurred in the south of England. But the great year of protest that I'm sure some of you who are historians know about, that took place um, basically in Paris in 1968, without the issue of animal welfare being mentioned at all, Great changes in social and moral attitudes were occurring. And in Britain, we had an outburst of satirical activity uh, beyond the fringe, and which eventually led to Monty Python and all that that I expect you, some of you know about. It was a way of criticizing our own society. Classism, if you, if you want to call it classism, social class awareness in Britain was under attack. Then racism came under, under fire. And then sexism. I mean, the word racism was never, never really used before the 1960s. People occasionally said racialism, but they didn't even get it right. They said racism later. And then the word sexism was invented. Then at last, came the attacks upon speciesism. I mean, I actually invented it while I was in my bath. <laughs> and I was thinking about racism and sexism. I think sexism must have been a very new word then. And I was thinking, why do the animals always get left out of this? The great forgotten area of suffering. If morality is based upon suffering and trying to prevent suffering, why is it that we always put our species first. Talking about chauvinism or snobbery, why are the human beings so conceited? And I lay in my bath thinking, the trouble is there's no snappy word for it. Um, Bridget Brophy has started this idea about animal rights, which is good, but it's a little bit clunky, and people tend to, if you used the phrase animal rights at that time, 1960, no, sorry, 1969, um, people thought you were a bit mad. Um, in England they did. Um, that you were a, an extremist of some sort. So I think they needed something a bit snappy, so I thought, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prejudice. So, it, as people who are concerned about different, about women and men having different rights and status. They are concerned about sexual differences. They are sexists. Um, people who, and this is almost everybody, assume that other species are inferior uh, must be speciesists. And that's how the word came to being. We started anyway um, uh, campaigning. Um, Bridget Brophy wrote to me, I wrote some letters to the newspapers complaining about cruelty to uh, animals in laboratories, and which I'd seen, of course, as an experimental psychologist at Cambridge. And Bridget Brophy wrote in support to me and said, Why, did you know that some philosophers at Oxford were, were also, also interested in the idea? So she put me in touch with the uh, Godloviches. Ros Godlovich, and um, it was very nice to meet somebody else who had similar thoughts. I seriously thought I was, I was mad. I mean, I was mad, but I was worried about it. And, and, and I thought, you know, I'm, why is it only me that's thinking this? Um, and I went to friends who were rational people, and I said, look, I think we should be concerned about the suffering of other species. Am I mad or what? 
And thank goodness some of them said, no, you're not mad. The more we think about it, the more it seems absolutely logical. Um, and so it was nice to meet, anyway, some philosophers who um, obviously knew how to think straight. They said, yes, it is a major problem, this. The interesting thing is, of course, that then it took off and the movement for a period was led by philosophers. Peter Singer appeared a, a year later, or two years later, um, and he was very taken with my word speciesism. I'd circulated a leaflet in 1960 around Oxford. It got no response. I circulated a second edition around Oxford, around the co colleges in Oxford, and there was some response. And, um, and then Peter Singer suddenly turns up. And of course, he's just a young um, Australian postgraduate philosopher, and, and he liked the word speciesism. I said I'd put it in there um, really just to be catchy as, some, as a psychologist would do it because it seemed to be more appealing than animal rights. Anyway, Peter joined the group and when the Godloviches and myself published this book Victims of Science in 1971 um, Peter reviewed it for the New York Review of Books. And he writes beautifully, as I expect you know, because some of you will have read his book, Animal Liberation, which he then wrote, asking me to be its joint author. And I turned down his kind offer because I was too busy campaigning. Uh, anyway, in 1970, um, I passed this leaflet around and we held demonstrations against cruel experiments in the streets of Oxford. Um, I organized uh, protests and demonstrations against otter hunting. Um, uh, do, do you know what an otter is? What is the German for otter? <laughs> you do. Otter. <laughs> well, that's an easy one. Good. Um, and uh, um, I met Rosalind and Stan Godlevich. They were from Canada. Um, they didn't like the word speciesism, incidentally, but Peter Singer did. But Peter Singer only, Peter Singer only arrived on the scene um, a little later and so didn't actually have, couldn't actually contribute to the book. Um, I then discovered afterwards that, that another great figure in the movement, Tom Regan, who really is the best of the trained philosoph philosophers writing about animal rights using the concept of rights which neither Peter nor myself use very much. Um, he has recently died, and we should remember Tom Regan as being really, he was such a formidable advocate of animal rights. I've never heard anyone get the better of an argument with him. He's a very nice man and a very formidable philosopher. The book, when it was published, received some good reviews, but the best, of course, was um, Peter Singer's review. It was such a good review that the New York Review of Books as a publishing company actually invited him to write a book on the subject, which became Animal Liberation. Unlike most of the others in the Oxford group, um, I was interested in getting new laws to protect animals, especially in laboratories, in factory farms, and in the wild. So I turned out to be an animal politician. And I, when I became chairman in 1977, I managed to set up RSPCA campaigning, international, scientific, and special investigation departments, as well as finding something called Eurogroup for, animal, for Animals in Brussels. I don't know if anybody's heard of, has anybody heard of Eurogroup? Yes? Oh, good. Good. That's a ten or so. Um, Eurogroup for Animals doesn't always publicise itself, but it's done very, very well. I also persuaded the RSPCA to publish um, a list of animal welfare policies, and uh, this was based upon very careful scientific evidence including, for the first time in its existence, the RSPCA came out in opposition to the hunting of 
foxes with hounds. The second thing I did was I made friends with a number of politicians of all parties, most notably with Lord Houghton of Sowerby, with whom I then worked closely from 1973 until his death in 1996. Thirdly, I worked with Clive Hollands, the director of the St Andrews Fund in Scotland, and we tried to begin to get the media interested in animal rights. It was very difficult to start with. The media just thought it was a joke. They thought that the whole of animal welfare was a subject that could be made fun of. From 1970 to 1975, the British press and electronic media were totally indifferent to the whole subject of animal welfare. They ridiculed it. On a daily basis, Clive and I would try, often vainly, to get the national media interested. When there was a demonstration, we'd ring up the newspapers to try and get them to report it. And they thought if there was a joke in it, they'd do it. But if there wasn't a joke, they'd forget it. Then in 1975, everything changed. The British media suddenly had discovered that this was a subject that fascinated their readers. So I'm giving you this story so that if ever you want to campaign for animals and you find your media not interested, keep going. Because if you, once you've got a story in a paper like that, you will find, as the Chinese media discovered recently, people are automatically concerned about cruelty to animals. And they will write in, and you've suddenly got a story that will sell newspapers. Things are going well in China. Um, there were several reports of cruelty that got into the media, and the reaction from the people was massive. As a result, the Chinese government is now planning to introduce its first legislation to protect animals from cruelty. Fourthly, in 1979, I joined forces with Brian Davis. Has anyone heard of Brian Davis? No, you see, it's sad. This is the reason why I mention these people. These are great people. Uh, Douglas Houghton and Brian Davis. Brian Davis is the founder of IFAW, IFAW, International Fund for Animal Welfare. He was the most hard-headed and practical of all the great um, animal welfare leaders in the world in recent years. He flew aeroplanes out to the seals. He, he took VIPs from Europe, Brigitte Bardot, and flew her out to, out to Canada. He learnt when he wasn't, he was, the Canadian government banned the flying of fixed-wing aircraft within three miles of seals in order to stop him. He learnt to fly helicopters and flew out helicopters. So they had to fly, they had to pass more legislation to stop helicopters, etc. So I helped him with his campaigning to protect seals and other wildlife. And together, um, we put animals into politics in London and in Brussels because we had set up this Eurogroup for Animal Welfare. It was hard work. Uh, I had to persuade lots of very conservative-minded people to give the RSPCA support to this idea of Eurogroup. But Eurogroup has done very good work over the years. Back in Oxford, I enjoyed the philosophical activities of the Oxford Group. It led the world in the awakening of serious interest in the ethics of the human animal relationship. Never before had a reform movement been led by so many philosophers. But I wanted to put animals into politics. I wanted to apply our new philosophy to formulate some new laws. This is how you make the transition from moral theory to practical <clears throat> um, ethics, to practical morality which is really what Peter Singer is now talking about. He's writing books about how you apply your sense of morality through investments, through going to public meetings of big companies and making speeches, objecting to their immoral actions, all these sort of practical things that we can do. Anyway, I wanted to put animals into politics. And... Um, I found myself the other, alone as a philosopher. The others weren't it so interested. I taught myself how to campaign using my two original objectives of trying to stop the hunting of otters and stopping cruel experiments on animals. 
As regards otter hunting, I launched a four-year campaign on, of sabotage using sprays and other chemicals to confuse the otter hounds. Between three and 30 of my friends came with me to hunt meetings in England. Uh, Dave Wetton came along as well. He was the organizer of the Hunt Saboteurs Association. I'm looking at my watch. And he came with me on half a dozen occasions, showing me how to confront the hounds using a hunting horn. He would use the hunting horn and draw the hounds away from the huntsman so that we would then go for a run with the hounds, so that the hounds were very happy, but they were three miles away from the huntsman, who was stuck on the other side of the river. They didn't like this. Anyway, but it made a funny story, and the newspapers reported it. As far as I was concerned, the point of such confrontations was to try to create national publicity. So I spent a good time on the telephone trying to stir up the reporters and the photographers. Sometimes I had success and sometimes I failed. On some occasions there was no publicity at all, and sometimes quite the reverse. Unexpected photographs on the front page of the Sunday Times, or five minutes on BBC national television. Between demonstrations, I would write incessantly to members of parliament. All my talks in those days, I would say, write to your member of parliament. And they did. As a result, within a few years, MPs started saying they got more letters and more interest and concern about animal welfare than any other subject. And they still do. The more publicity we got, the more the MPs wanted to help. I also contacted and supported the conservationists about the otters, um, and together we worked together. So the animal welfareists, animal rights people worked with the conservationists. Finally, we achieved success when Parliament protected otters in 1978. Stopping cruelty to animals in experiments was, of course, much harder. I'd seen some of these cruelties myself in British and American laboratories where I worked as a psychologist. I contacted the existing anti-vivisection societies, the media, and members of parliament, uh, one of whom I've already said was Douglas Houghton, who'd been a member of the uh, Wilson cabinet, a very distinguished man. Uh, when Douglas Houghton retired from government in 1979, um, I persuaded him briefly to join the council of the RSPCA. But seeing the great conservatism of that body, Houghton decided to campaign on his own. And he asked me to join him in setting up a new committee to look at reforming the legislation protecting research on animals. We called it the Committee for the Reform of Animal Experimentation. Um, we formed a core of three, Douglas Houghton, Clive Hollands, and myself. But we asked in various other scientists to support us, and we found some who did. There were even one or two lawyers who showed an interest at that stage. We wrote a memorandum of proposal reforms, which we published and gave to the Home Secretary, the Minister of the Interior, um, in May 1976. Our emphasis was upon controlling pain. Uh, Douglas Houghton, of course, knew various uh, Home Secretaries, various Ministers of the Interior, Roy Jenkins, Merlin Rees, William Whitelaw, and over the ensuing years we had meetings with all of them to discuss our proposed reforms. During the general election campaigns, we set up the General Election Coordinating Committee, which aimed to put animals into politics by lobbying all the political parties, asking for reforms before the election. You'll get much more from a politician before an election than after, obviously. But I'm just giving that, uh, making that observation. So I'm sure some of you, I'm sure, know that very well already. Um, we persuaded Margaret Thatcher, who you've heard of, to uh, pledge that she would update the law protecting laboratory animals if she became Prime Minister, and she did. And she introduced, eventually, the Animal Scientific Procedures Act in 1986. So the campaign, as far as I was concerned, had taken some 15 years. I'll just go back to Eurogroup a bit. While I was RSPCA chairman in 1979, 80, 
I managed to persuade the RSPCA to set up Eurogroup for Animal Welfare based in Brussels. It has its main office in Brussels. And since that time, it, it has been, it remains, the main campaigning body for animal protection in the EU. For nearly 40 years, it has lobbied the Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council of Ministers for new legislation. It has been hugely successful. Since its foundation in 1980, 44 animal protection laws have been passed in the EU. 44. 80, 18 of these were on farm animal welfare, 11 on wildlife, 8 on research animals, and 4 on pet animals. Now, Eurogroup, as some of you may know, is composed of representatives from each member state. Its first chief executive of Eurogroup was the highly effective Mike Seymour Rice, whom I appointed in 1979 on his retirement from being the RSPCA's head of publicity. He was a very old-fashioned sort of Englishman. He'd actually been in Berlin in 1940. His father was an official, a, a high-ranking official at the British Embassy, and Mike had just joined the British Army as a 19-year-old, and he didn't get out fast enough and was made a prisoner of war. So he spent five years in Germany and came out speaking German, being able to speak German. So he was a useful person to have in Europe. Um, when he retired from the RSPCA head of publicity job. And then they, we pumped in some, I think over the years, perhaps around 20 million pounds into Eurogroup. A lot of money gone into it. And Eurogroup continues to be very effective. It has an office in Brussels employing about a dozen people, 12 people approximately. Um, some of them German speakers, some of them French speakers, etc. Some of them Italian speakers, some of them specializing in farm animals, others in laboratory animals, others in, in wildlife uh, reforms. But I'm speak, saying all this because I, there may be some people present who are thinking of having careers in animal protection, who are lawyers, and they will need to work with Eurogroup. Perhaps they'll get a job with them. Seymour Rice was succeeded by Ian Ferguson and David Wilkes, Wilkinson. Although other pressure groups such as Compassion in World Farming, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, have played important parts over the years in specialized fields, Eurogroup has been the main interface between European government and legislation. Eurogroup has not sought publicity for itself, as some other bodies have had to do over the years. Later, Seymour Rice worked for Brian Davis's I4 in Eurogroup, sorry, in Europe, organizing mass protests in Strasbourg and Brussels for the whales, the seals, and fur animals. Seymour Rice died in 1999. To a large extent, he had managed to initiate the legislative process in the EU, along the lines, very often, of the RSPCA's animal welfare policies. The period from 1970, I have been asked to speak on for such a long time, I hope you're not getting bored. The period from 1970 to, to the year 2005 represents 35 years of unprecedented progress in animal welfare, not only in Britain but in Europe and the rest of the world. The political interest reached a peak in Britain in the 1990s when it was constantly a matter for discussion in Parliament. For years, as I've said, British MPs received more letters about animals than any other subject. We eventually passed 12 laws protecting animals in the UK, in addition to the 44 new laws in Europe. I became a director of Brown Davis's political animal lobby in the 1990s in the British Parliament. And it was a question of getting to know members of Parliament and helping them to introduce these new laws. Why basically was so much progress made from 1970 until the year 2005 and so little subsequently, at least in Britain? Progress, I think, was made because we concentrated upon generating national publicity and making friends with media people and politicians. 
In other words, it had been about publicity and politics. In addition, we kept the hugely influential RSPCA on side, although it was often weak as a campaigning body because it was more concerned about rescuing animals. It never opposed any of the reforms that we were seeking. Ultimately, we had the RSPCA helping us, the media helping us, and Parliament helping us, all because the British public were on our side. And I'm sure in Germany it's the same. Public opinion, if you ask people, is very strongly against cruelty to animals. This is true wonderfully across the world. As soon as you reach some level of affluence in a society, and as soon as you are peaceful in a society, people's thoughts tend to go to the other animals, to the other species. They have some time and compassion to spare for the animals. But as I said, Britain has rather ground to a halt in recent years. There are at least six possible reasons. We've done the easy reforms and the rest are much harder. Or secondly, the public erroneously believes that there's no more that needs to be done. Many of the great campaigning figures have gone, such as Houghton and Davis. In the EU, some of the recent joiners in the East are not supportive of animal welfare, or not so supportive of animal welfare. Fifthly, in the UK, politicians have felt exhausted by the 10-year parliamentary battle to outlaw fox hunting, which we won in 2006. But it was after years of fighting, and it rather sickened some of the politicians and some of the public, actually, felt there was too much time being spent on the fox hunting issue. But of course the reason why it took so long was because the fox hunters are very well organized people. And there are many of them professional people, lawyers and others, and they knew how to fight politically. They're still fighting. In the UK, the defeated pro-fox hunters turned the media against us. The two men who've obviously taught me most about advocacy have been Douglas Houghton and Brown Davies. Houghton taught me how important it is to know the influential people and to be friends with them. London officials, uh, government officials, Westminster researchers, press reporters, EU commissioners, editors, members of parliament, government ministers. Those sort of people. Brown Davis taught me the same, plus the importance of high-profile publicity, emotion, good experts employing good lawyers, good scientists to support your case, good research into public opinion so that you can go to the politicians and say, look, 79% of your voters want you to do this. That makes them sit up, even if they're not interested really themselves. They, they are concerned about their votes. Above all, Brian Davis taught me not to waste time talking too much to ourselves when we needed to be out there talking to our opponents and to these influential people. He taught me to go straight into action, straight to the top. So this is maybe what we're missing in British campaigning today. We need laws based upon ethics, and ethics based upon the prevention of pain. Whoever suffers it, dogs, monkeys, aliens, robots, or humans, all sentient species should be part of the same moral and legal community. All animals can suffer, so all animals need protection. Laws can protect millions of animals from suffering. Above all, my message to you today is that we need new laws all over the world. Thank you.